I was introduced to the awe-inspiring world of orcas when I was just seven years old. I was presented with the book Siwiti, A Whale's Story. I would stare at the beautiful images in this book for hours as a child. I was mesmerized by the beauty and mystery of orcas, and I could only imagine what it might be like to encounter these beautiful mammals in the wild. What were they thinking? Did they dream like me? I have always had a longing to be near them. I feel connected to them in a way that I can't explain. When I finally got to be close to them in the wild, it changed me. Killer whales, to me, are one of the most magnificent animals on the planet. You know, they're, when you think of the most badass creature the planet's got right now, it's gotta be orcas. Um, they're so much bigger than sharks. They're so much more intelligent, so much more aware. The fact that they're out there and they're roaming the oceans and they're social and they're intelligent and they're conscious is amazing. In cloth bit. That means the head killer whale or the leader of a, of a pack of whales. I know you guys like to say pods, but pack sounds way better because they're sea wolves, you know. And 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 cloth base, a big fin in the front. He's the main one. Cloth bit. Yeah. We have a place on uh, an island in British Columbia called Quadra Island, and we took our boat along the east coast, right up to the top, to a channel, and. My wife spotted a, a killer whale, so we turned the engine off and just floated. And there must have been at least 70 killer whales that came through. They were of all sizes. And it was just an amazing thing to see these animals come through and to see them roll on their side and actually look at you like they knew we were there, but they ignored us and, and kept going through. But to see that uh, huge pod was, well, just a magical moment that, uh, that changes your, your whole life, I think. There was a fantastic party of uh, orcas down in Robson Bight that just kept us amazed for hours. All of these uh, different family groups getting together and, and just singing to one another. It's not, it's not too far uh, from an accurate description, probably, but it was just wonderful for hours and hours we listened to them. Coming up all together in unison, rising as a group right in front of the lab, practically within touching distance of the shore. And they, they rose and breathed together and sank down below and rose again and did the same thing five or six times and then they disappeared again. It was an amazing moment. For a mammal that can never go into a cave and can never build a fort or climb a tree and curl up in a little cozy nook of the tree, the only security they have is, is each other and their world of sound is how they keep in touch with each other. So they embody family more than, more than humans. My sense of love and respect for orcas goes deep into my bones. I am attracted to their strong social bonds the way they travel together, socialize and play, hunt and forage for food, rest and sleep, and watch out for one another as a family unit. The northern and southern resident orca whales around British Columbia are known to live with their mother for their entire lifetime. Family is everything to them. 
I've learned important things watching and listening to them. Orca whales have been in existence for millions of years and the northern and southern resident orcas have thrived on the BC coast since the last ice age. Though they are sometimes called killer whales, orcas are not whales, but they are the largest member of the dolphin family. Alexandra Morton, the author of CBT, A Whale's Story, has spent most of her adult life living among the orcas, working to protect their habitat. When I first came out here, it was such a vast wilderness that I remember I would just always keep my finger on the chart because I was afraid that I would be lost indefinitely if I got lost. The whales are my neighbors. Um, I, I see them as I would any people, another community. Are you concerned about their well-being? Yeah, I'm very concerned about their well-being. They're not socializing as much, they're traveling more. Um, they're not being shot and, and purposely harassed as much. Our ignorance and the way that we project our own ignorance onto other animals is something that I think uh, we better learn from what we've learned from killer whales. We are astonishingly ignorant. Killer whales are a part of the marine ecosystem, fascinating creatures, and we demonize them as pests or fearsome animals. In June of 1961, Canada's federal government approved mounting a 50 caliber machine gun on Vancouver Island at Seymour Narrows after being pressured by fishermen to reduce the number of orcas believed to be depleting the salmon population. Many fishermen routinely shot killer whales, considering them rivals for the precious salmon they depended on for a living. The general public once thought of killer whales as fearsome, man-eating predators. How did we go from fearing and hating these beautiful animals to loving them and wanting to be near them? The shift in public opinion on orca whales can be traced to July of 1964, when Vancouver Aquarium hired Samuel Burrich, a sculptor and fisherman, to harpoon and kill an orca. It was to be used as a model to build a fiberglass replica orca for display. When the orca didn't die, even after shooting it with a rifle, the aquarium director had his team tow the whale, like a dog on a leash, by the embedded harpoon for 80 nautical miles to Vancouver. The orca, named Moby Doll by the aquarium, did not eat for 55 days. Finally, the killer whale was offered a ling cod, which it did eat. Moby Doll ate more than 50 kilograms of cod that day. the keepers hadn't realized resident killer whales prefer to eat fish, not warm-blooded prey they had been trying to feed it. Dr. Murray Newman, the aquarium director, was the scientist in charge. You're recording. Uh, could you give us a, a listen to these? Yeah, certainly. These were made with a hydrophone in the water. Any idea just what the, these noises might be in response to? Oh, they may be uh, curiosity on the part of the whale. They might be uh, a sign of nervousness on her part, or she may be calling uh, out into the water for others of her kind. As many as 20,000 people came to see the whale in a makeshift pen at the Burrard Dry Docks. The One Day Open House was the first public exhibition of an orca. This was nothing like the monster most imagined killer whales to be. After only 86 days in captivity, the whale sank to the bottom of its pen and died. But aquariums around the world were soon eager to have an orca of their own. In 
1967, the Vancouver Aquarium purchased two killer whales. Dr. Newman hired psychologist Dr. Paul Spong to work with the orcas at Vancouver Aquarium. After studying the whales up close in captivity, Spong recognized orca whales as highly intelligent social animals and became an advocate for freeing whales from captivity and moving the study of orcas to their natural habitat. I used to, when in very early days, try to get close to whales, but it was a long time ago. I suppose in, in many ways one, one thinks that there may be something happening between uh, whales and oneself. I think a lot of people on boats, for example, think that whales are coming uh, specifically to, to entertain them or speak to them or something like that. My own um, attitude is to step back. In 1970, Paul Spong headed 300 kilometers northwest of Vancouver to a quiet bay where orcas retreat in the summer to feed and give birth. There he established Orca Lab. He wasted no time immersing himself in the remote study of wild orcas. Spong mounted numerous underwater hydrophones and paired them with radio receivers so the sounds of the whales could be listened to, recorded, and studied. We're going to see, I think, in the next few decades, very big changes in the oceans and in the ability of the whales to sustain their lifestyle. Orca Lab is committed to studying the whales in a non-invasive way by doing land-based observation with binoculars and telescopes and listening to orca calls using underwater hydrophones, the whales are studied in their natural environment without interference. Orca enthusiasts, filmmakers, and marine biology students from around the world come to Orca Lab every summer to volunteer. In the summer of 2012, I applied and was accepted for a volunteer position at Orca Lab as a filmmaker to document the whales in their natural habitat in the Johnstone Strait. Although I had been among different types of whales and taken photos and video in different locations around the world, many times having close encounters, this was different. I spent six weeks on West Craycroft Island, smack dab in the middle of killer whale territory. Pretty nice, eh? Yeah. We like it here. This was the realization of a lifelong dream, to live among the orcas. In addition to contributing to the scientific research and learning about the whales, in the quiet solitude, I learned a lot about myself and the values that matter most to me. My home, was a tiny elevated hut and viewing platform over a kelp forest and a continually rising and falling ocean. Some mornings, I was awakened to the sound of whale blows in the morning mist. I had none of the luxuries of my home in Ontario, but somehow I had everything I needed. I was getting more in touch with the wild parts of myself and connecting with nature around me in a deep way. Individual orcas have been named and tracked over decades. Distinct saddle patches and scars on the dorsal fins are like fingerprints used to identify individuals. As a contributor to the research at Orca Lab, 
I recorded whale behaviors like porpoising, spy hopping, breaching, playing, sleeping, and resting. One day, I watched resident orcas harass a humpback whale. I was warned about black bears and cougars on the island and did not wander too far. One morning, I woke to a black bear on the rocks below my hut. It was even the small connections that were memorable, like the snake who lived under my solar panel. I would pet him on his little head. I named him Sammy. And I wish that I had spent the last, you know, 30 years just concentrating on their sounds, because that's what I came here to do, was figure out what they're saying. Killer whales produce three categories of sounds, clicks, whistles, and pulsed calls. By listening to and observing the orcas, researchers have been able to identify the matrilineal family structure of killer whale pods. Oh. Center. Each family has its own distinct dialect, and researchers are able to distinguish between different families by the sounds they make. Orca communications are monitored and recorded 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the summer months. I'm absolutely concerned for the whales and the way in which the oceans are changing. And I fear for their future. The warming of the oceans, for example, is going to drastically affect the whale, the orca's food supply. There are very great risks ahead of the whales, very great problems. Whether or not they can deal with them in the short term is a big question. People in boats, should probably understand that it's not that helpful to whales to get that close to them, that they can't do the ordinary things that they need to do, like find food, for example, you know. It would be quite wonderful if uh, people would develop vessel propulsion systems that weren't so noisy, because the orcas are acoustic creatures and they rely on sound and noise disturbs them. By 9 a.m., the first fleet of boat tours would be on the water, tracking down the whales. Human impact in the region is ever-present with boat traffic, including logging, fishing, pleasure boating, and cruise liners heading up to Alaska. Before motorized boats ever came to this area, First Nations people shared a much deeper connection to the land and sea, and to the life within. I needed to hear from someone whose family was indigenous to this territory, someone who had learned through the legends passed down from his ancestors. 
my grandmother told a story about, uh, and she said this isn't necessarily a legend, uh, that, that you don't bother the killer. Well, she told the story because people were starting to, uh, to bug the killer whales as they were going by. People were bothering them. And she said it's wrong to do that because they don't forget. They'll follow you to the land and follow you in your dreams and they won't let you go. They'll, they'll follow you. But they say that there was this guy that was really, really good friends with the killer whale. He was a chief. And one day he was traveling and his canoe flipped over. And he drowned. And the, the killer whales came along and they wanted so he can have a decent burial from him. So the killer whales just kept pushing him up, keeping him at the surface. And then the tide was taking him in. And the waves brought him right and laid him on a beach in a soft spot there. And that's because he was friendly with the whales and they looked after him. And that's one of our legends, one of our stories. My granny said, leave them alone and treat them with respect. Kilo Machino, that's the name of the killer whales. Wayne Alfred is from Alert Bay, which is known as the home of the killer whale. He is Namgi First Nations. And why they're on our pole and they're one of our crests because they're in our legends and our stories. I remember when Namu came here, uh, I was a little kid, and uh, they had him caged up. And so we went up there, my grandfather, you want to go see a killer whale? He says, white man got them all caged up up by Haddington Island. <laughs> so we went up there, and uh, all we seen was little ones all around that, swimming around that cage. And they had, they had Namu inside that cage, yeah. Victims of the encaging society, just like the rest of us. We all get treated that way. Yeah, and then they put her in some kind of aquarium down south, and so everybody can come and... Yeah, yeah, okay, that's a killer whale story, too. A 22-foot killer whale was accidentally trapped in a fisherman's salmon net in June of 1965. The orca was sold to Ted Griffin, owner of the Seattle Aquarium, for $8,000. On the dock at Namu, the enterprising griffin spent thousands constructing a floating cage for the whale. The whale swam along to his new home, an exhibition pen, at the Seattle waterfront, over 700 kilometers away. The story of the captured whale was a global sensation. The crowds came in droves to see the killer whale griffin named Namu. There was bound to be a song written about Namu the whale. Song of that. Namu, for a short time, would be the first healthy orca to be displayed in an aquarium exhibit. Showmanship was from the beginning a big part of the show. Ted Griffin was the first human to swim with an orca a daring act that led to total trust and acceptance. A popular movie was made starring Namu, giving millions of people their first close-up look at a killer whale. In just 11 months' time, the whale contracted an infection from polluted water in his pen and died. I spotted a killer whale. It was right beside the boat. I said, Severn, get up here. Look." Here's a killer whale. So she came running out of the uh, cabin up to the deck, and there was a killer whale just as it went down. And then we were watching and watching and watching to see. And then I said, there it is. Look, look. And I expected Severn to be going, oh, wow. You know, you know. And she didn't say a word. And I looked down, and she was weeping. She was about 10. She said, Daddy. Look how far it went with one breath of air. And we keep them in such a tiny place. Here's a 10-year-old child. And she just knew that animal was meant to be free out in the ocean. That really shook me uh, to have a child's ability to see so clearly our relationship with whales.
we're not going to protect what we don't love or don't understand. So by keeping some sharks in captivity, by keeping some animals in captivity, we get to understand these systems and these relationships. And I think that's phenomenally important. It's not necessarily the individual suffering of one animal that I'm concerned about. It's more the ecosystem consequences in the millions of years of evolution that created this world that I think we need to focus on. Right now, we're in a really significant predicament where we've so destroyed the natural world, our life support system, and the creatures that live there that our survival is threatened this century. And knowing humanity behaves in, in selfish ways in most instances, um, for us to save and conserve the world we depend on for survival, we're going to need a relationship with these animals. We're going to need to see them as interesting. Uh, we're not going to protect what we don't love or don't understand. So I think humanity needs to come together and say, Let's get this right, let's design a world that's going to be beautiful, and let's rewild the planet. And by rewilding the planet, we can leapfrog over the environmental issues we face right now. I met a man who has lived his whole life wild and free in these parts. There used to be lots of orcas go by, or killer whales, or blackfish, we always called them. We didn't know any different. Called them blackfish all the time, and they used to go by here by the hundreds, but they don't seem to be that many anymore. Although once in a while there's some big pods, I guess when that offshore pod comes in, I don't know. Billy Proctor doesn't drive a car. He goes by boat everywhere. He has lived on these waters his entire life, either on an island or a float house. The two old missionaries that used to come from Village Island, they'd come and I'd walk down there to the beach and meet them and help them out of their dugout canoes. And Mum would invariably send me down to go and meet the ladies. And then they'd say, well, how's the heathen today? Because they didn't like me very much. And then they, they like you. They tried to take me away. They wanted to take me away to a residential school up at Metlakatla, which is up by Prince Rupert. And then they reported me to the welfare and said Mum wasn't capable of looking after me in such a place, so the welfare would come in and want to take me away, but I used to run and hide in the bush. <laughs> Are you serious? I am. That's a straight truth. I spent more time in the bush than I did anywhere else. So you learned everything you needed to learn from surviving out here? Pretty well, yeah. I learned an awful lot by just sitting on this beach watching all the critters and walking the beach at low tide. And I used to go along the beach with a little wee dip net. I'd borrow my mum's little sifter and go along the beach with a bucket of water and scoop up little fish. And then I had a really good book and I'd go and look and see what kind. So I learned all the little different kinds of fish. And then I'd sit and watch them by the hour. I used to sit right here on the beach and let the tide come in all around me, exploring all the little rocks and islands, looking for wildflowers and birds' nests. And... So that's all I did when I was supposed to be going to school, I guess. Well, like I tell people, I've had a love affair with fish ever since I sat on that beach when I was four years old, and watching the critters. And fish are such a fascinating creature. It just, I just, I get in arguments with people. I've been over at Echo Bay and people will haul up a ratfish or people will come in with a big ling cod and they say, oh, what a nuggly critter. And I just get so mad when I hear that because every fish, don't matter what it is, an old sculpin or a ratfish, they've all got some form of beauty to them. Oh, there's one going up there. One made it. See him? Just up there. Salmon is one of the main food sources for the northern and southern resident orca whales. It took a phenomenally long time to notice everything. I never noticed the fry migrations of salmon very much, except, you know, to catch one to eat. I just had eyes for the whales. And now I see it breathe with the tide and the salmon of the bloodstream carrying those nutrients from the open ocean.
Basically, we started out, well, Alexander Morton started in 2001, um, studying sea lice, the impacts of sea lice on salmon fry, juvenile salmon. We have core projects that run monitoring the impacts of sea lice on salmon fry, and that was the pioneered work that was done here on this coast, was the first on this coast to look at, you know, how many sea lice does it take to cause mortality in a juvenile salmon? And it turns out on, you know, a small salmon fry, pink or chum, about this big, you know, without scales, just fresh out of the river, two, two sea lice, and, and that's it, you know, for that little salmon fry. And back in 2002 and 2003, we were seeing levels up to 30 to 50 sea lice per salmon fry. These salmon farms amplify pathogens, so parasites, sea lice, bacteria, viruses. And they end up being these like mushroom clouds coming out of the farms of whatever is brewing in there. What following the salmon has really brought to mind is humanity's best bet to survive and perhaps their only bet to survive is to learn how to work with the natural system. Like when I look across there, I see a rain-making machine. You've got the Pacific cool air coming in, there's mountains right there, and I, I, I watch again and again as the clouds just rear up and pour water into the Nimkish watershed which has an enormous lake and all these rivers and a short, wide, beautiful river to the ocean where you have swift tides and easy access to the Pacific. That is a fish-making machine. That is the powerful thing. Not a little net with a generator running and you get fish from Chile and, and, and food from somewhere else and um, you kind of take out less fish than you throw in and uh, People think, that, <laughs> people think that that's making food, but you know any one of those links break, all of which are fragile. Price of fuel goes up, run out of fish and chili to use as food, get a big disease, which I think is happening right now. That system goes down, and we lose the one that was coming to us for free. So, you know, part of my biggest effort right now is like teaching people the birds and the bees. It's like, okay guys, you need this. This makes food, this makes power, this makes oxygen for us. That's important. You know, I mean, I hate to trivialize it, but when you have companies that are bigger than countries, selling things you don't really need, and you start feeding all your, all your, all your resources, your financial resources are going in to feed this monster that really doesn't even have a mind. It doesn't really care what it does. It would just as happily roll over us as not. But we need to learn that what you want to do is benefit this and your community, because your community is your support system as well. Who would have thought something as small as sea lice could be connected to the health and well-being of a creature as large as a killer whale, the top predator in the ocean? The biggest concern for the oceans right now is that humanity is stuck concerned about climate change and not addressing ocean acidification. So climate change is inclement weather and rising sea levels and changing currents and stuff, and that's amazing. But when you tell that to a young person or a kid, it's not that urgent or that necessary, and the ramifications are always over there. You know, it's Bangladesh, it's, you know, some parts of Florida that we can migrate out of if we need to. Ocean acidification has reset life, you know, five times with mass extinctions in the past, and I think ocean acidification has a far bigger potential to mess up this world than any other environmental issue right now, but we're not addressing it. Who would have imagined the oceans that cover 70% of the planet. Who would have imagined humans could ever become so powerful? We could change the physical, chemical, and biological properties of the ocean. But we have altered the ocean uh, enormously because we've become so powerful technologically. We've, we've altered the oceans in so many 
accidental ways that we didn't intend. Uh, with the uh, adoption of artificial fertilizers, farmers have been able to, to spread very large quantities of nitrogen fertilizer onto fields, but of course the fields are ultimately linked to the oceans through rain and, and streams and rivers and creeks. That nitrogen load then washes out to sea and it causes eutrophication, it causes uh, dead zones in the ocean because life can't exist there. Uh, we of course in our plasticized society use plastics in so many ways that are now ending up in the ocean. Again it's the scale of the impact of human beings on the ocean that is really uh, shocking to me that in my lifetime the oceans of the world have been transformed. By the year 2050, it is projected that there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Having as much plastic in the ocean as fish is crazy. And I think this is, you know, accumulating in our bodies. We've got an average of a pound of plastic in our bodies. Uh, because that's what's in the environment and that's what's in the oceans and the same concentrations of lead and mercury and cadmium that are in the oceans and the waterways by where you live are in your body. So we know we don't pollute the environment, we pollute ourselves. We are utterly embedded in nature for our very existence and our well-being. And we forget that. We forget that in a city where we think, oh, we're sophisticated modern critters and, and uh, you know, money is the most important thing to, to, to live well. And we forget that it's nature that's the ultimate source of the things that matter most to us. If you look at the population of orcas that inhabits the coastal waters of British Columbia, you go back about 10,000 years to the end of the last ice age when these uh, waters started to become available to them and the uh, rivers formed and the salmon started to move into the rivers and spawn and become the food supply for the orcas. And their families grew and they continued from generation to generation over really thousands of years. And what we are seeing now, I'm afraid, is a step backwards. I do think they're going to have increasing trouble in the short term. Over the long term, however, I think they're survivors. I hope Orca Lab will carry on uh, and develop uh, in ways uh, that are compatible with the ideas and philosophy that we have. Exactly what it will become, I don't know, but I'm Rather hopeful that in my declining years, I'll be able to sit wherever I am and watch the scene that I grew up with. After my time at Orca Lab, I traveled north. been dreaming about a place I had never been before, Haida Gwaii. One day, I was invited out fishing in the North Island area. Although fishing is not my favorite activity, I was delighted to get out on the water. My friends had never seen orcas in this area, and I was told that it was highly unlikely that we would see them. We were in for a surprise. Once on the water, I spotted a tall dorsal fin, and then another, and another, and I yelled, killer whales! A pod of orcas approached our boat. We turned off the motor and drifted. A mother came right underneath the bow of the boat where I was sitting, and I saw a baby swim right up next to her. Time stood still. I had a strong feeling at that moment that I was pregnant with a baby. I knew it was time to go home to my family. Mm -hmm. 
Shortly after this boat ride, I packed up my belongings and returned home to Ontario. Nine months later, I delivered a healthy baby boy and I named him Everest. Are you grandma? What do they call you? Yeah, okay. Grandma? They embody family more than, more than humans. You know, to watch a mother go around a point from a juvenile and then see her rushing back calling, you know that she was listening the whole time and as soon as her, her youngster went out at earshot, she noticed and came back. And then you see them when they go to sleep, the mom and her 30-year-old son and often a daughter are all breathing together as they go to sleep. So they really embody family. I was on the water one day and there was two calves that were hanging out. They were from different matcher lines. Um, one of them was like maybe three and the other one was maybe six. And they seemingly were trying really, really, really hard to spy hop in synchrony and it just wasn't working out and like one would come up and then the other or they'd like spy hop into each other which was always really funny and they spent like half an hour trying to do this before they gave up and it was just hilarious to watch um, and I, I never did get to see the culmination of this but I was told that about a week later they actually did get a perfect up and down together. Nice. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty funny to watch. There were four, three or four killer whales right out in the bay. And I said, look at that seal. There was a seal right in the middle of the, this pod of whales. And I thought, what's going on? And then suddenly, one of the killer whales flipped the seal up into the air and threw it. And then the other killer whales went rushing over. And then they flipped it up again. And I realized that the killer whale was actually teaching its youngsters how you catch a seal. Again, uh, an interesting thing about the relationship of, of adults with their, their children and realizing, you know, these are wild animals, uh, but they don't naturally know how to hunt seals or whatever they're targeting. They have to learn and they pass this knowledge on to their offspring. But I think we need to have children experience some aspect of, of the natural world to realize that we're a biological creature ourselves and we depend on the rest of nature for our survival. As we trace the movement of humans across the planet, from Africa, you can follow a wave of extinction that accompanied our movement. We just went in and with clubs and spears and bows and arrows, we wiped out the easy uh, species. And what happened is, you know, people kept moving because they had to find new resources. The ones that stayed, of course, had to learn from the mistakes of the past. Really, the best thing I've done in my life is just stay in one place for 26 years and watch it. It's a very female form of science. There's lots of women doing it. Uh, men tend to do the spectacular forays into dangerous, you know, crazy places, and I love hearing what they found out, but my children stopped me from moving, and, um, I think that the places on Earth that are going to survive are the ones that are well-loved by people that really know them. In big cities, we can go for days and days in Toronto, live in an air-conditioned apartment, go down in our air-conditioned car, drive to our air-conditioned office downtown, which is connected through tunnels to air-conditioned shops. We don't have to go outside for days. So in a city, our 
highest priority is our job. And so the economy, we think, is our highest priority. And we forget that we're biological creatures. The most important priority we have is air. If you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe polluted air, you're sick. And it's with water, you and I are 60 to 70% water by weight. But our bodies leak water and we have to drink water all the time. If you don't have water for four to six days, you're dead. Polluted water, you're sick. So these are very simple things. Maybe we have to love ourselves just a little bit more in order to be concerned about the things that matter most. I think the message of environmentalism is that the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists, doesn't have boundaries in it. You know, even the air, the, the land, and the oceans, they're all connected. That's why the Haida said Guayhanas, the park down at the bottom of their islands. Guayhanas doesn't stop at the ocean. You have to keep it, you have to extend it out. And so the environment minister signed an agreement that Guayhanas, this national park reserve, would extend from the tops of the mountains out 10 kilometers into the ocean to the edge of the continental shelf because the oceans the land and the air are all a part of a single system. Everything is connected to everything else. That means whatever we do has repercussions. And therefore, whatever we do carries responsibilities. And I think we've become so thoughtless, thoughtless in the way that we treat nature, the way that we treat other, other species. We have to be much more thoughtful about that because we have a responsibility as the top predator on the planet. If we remove barriers to wild salmon, such as, you know, impacts of fish farms or, you know, detrimental logging in salmon watersheds, if we remove those types of barriers, we can see the salmon, wild salmon, coming back. By us fighting against our problems, we're immediately underdogs and radicals, and we're not going to win. I think we need to rise above the challenge. Einstein said you can't solve a problem at the same level of thinking that created it. And by stooping to the level of the problem right now and going up against it, we're doing just that. By being an activist and fighting against our problems in that way, you're immediately an underdog and a radical. And how are you going to win when you're going up against what we do and how we live and how we drive and how we consume? I don't think that world is one that we should be in any longer. I think we should be imagineers and we should be imagining what this world would look like if we got it right and focusing on that. And then by creating that vision, drawing humanity into that. So to solve some of these problems, like how are we gonna clean Lake Ontario so that Lake Ontario is thriving and full of fish and that's where Toronto eats fish from? How are we gonna pull carbon from the atmosphere into life in the most efficient way? How are we gonna restore life to the oceans? I think these are some of the questions we need to be asking and focusing on as activists um, because by endeavoring to, to bring life back to this planet and by cleaning it up in a way will we'll usurp the current environmental battles that we're in and I think we'll call out the best in us. To the orcas, with love. You were on this planet long before us, and we can learn so much from your ancient wisdom. Hearing you take a deep breath gives me permission to breathe deep and soothe my own soul. Thank you for letting me witness you dancing in the ocean to your own song. Thank you for letting me have a glimpse into a tiny part of your world and for letting me learn from you by watching and listening. Even for what felt like a short time, it has changed me. It has grounded me. 
It has reminded me about what matters most of all in my own life. Being kind to myself and to others, caring for my family, sharing my love, and always remembering to breathe deep. You have taught me I am inseparable from nature and that even in grief, we must keep moving forward. I have seen evidence of your consciousness and I have seen you looking at me. Thank you for reminding me that my son needs to grow up wild. My deepest wish is that others can awaken to see your beauty and your wisdom and acknowledge your importance on this planet. With love, Natalie. Here, do you see the mom with the baby? Dad, there's two, one, and two, and three, and four. How can a young person uh, maybe change their life mm -hmm. for the better? Young people have as much power to change the world as any adult does, uh, maybe more so. Young people can watch what they consume. They can direct their dollars, they can direct their parents, and they can direct economies and governments. Uh, every time young people put their foot down and say something needs to change, government policy seems to change. Um, so I would tell young people that this is the challenge of their generation, that if they are gonna live in a world that's as beautiful or more than their parents, they gotta fight for this, and they gotta be all they can be and step it up and grow and, and call the best in them to figure this out.